Hello, Com 100. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Chapter 10, Communication and New Media. Uh, you'll hopefully have your books available to you, and we're going to look essentially on page 241 and following. Uh, so as we're looking at this, when we talk about uh, new media specifically, um, we're talking about all the things that have come out. And a lot of it is social media as of late, of course. And with these COVID-19 um, issues and, and things that have been going on, obviously the social media has become even more integral to communication studies and communication practice as people are certainly doing just that. So as we're looking at um, getting the, the edge on things, uh, to quote, if you will, page 242, in the orange box. Um, one, of, one of the things that we're looking at is we want to make sure that we follow how has communication traditionally been working? Well, there is, of course, um, if you kind of think back through history and your, your definition and understanding of history, before there was technology, we did a lot of writing. Before there was writing, we did a lot of what we call the oral tradition. Remember, of course, that early on in this semester, I mentioned Walter Fisher, a communication scholar from the uh, University of Iowa, back in some of the early days of communication as an academic discipline. And one of the things that Walter Fisher used to say is that we are more homo nerens than we are homo sapiens. Now, when I think about that, for instance, homo nerens, we are people of the narrative. We are people of the story. And in some cases, when we talk about being people of the story, story, homo nerens, are even more important to us as, uh, as our identity and as our self than homo sapienism is, meaning that biological self, that human being that we exist. And see, when we exist, of course, as a homo sapien, um, we're often willing to give up that existence in the name of a story. Think about that for a minute. We are actually willing to give up our lives, in some cases, for the defense of a story. How about the story of a nation? And the story of the nation that produces its citizens to be highly patriotic. And it is that patriotism that allows us to enlist in a, in, a, in a military, go to war, and defend essentially that story. And, the, and a, because of the story and the country and the story it represents back and forth and what the, the country represents, the story, the story, the country, um, and all of the values that go along with it. By the same token, if that doesn't uh, uh, make the greatest example, think of religion. Now, of course, I'm not advocating one religion or another, but there are many different religions in the world that are based on a book, and that book tells the story, often the origin story, of that particular faith and how it came to be. And often we then look at that, and there are a lot of what we might call martyrs, People who have died in defense of the faith because of the faith that they're paying attention to, the faith that they believe, the faith that they will defend, the faith that they're willing to die for. And in essence, from an academic perspective, what they're doing is they're dying in defense of a story. And so when we talk about the oral tradition, one of the things that we often talk about is that we are... Um, people who start, who started off in the oral tradition, and then oftentimes media has a tendency to overlay on top of that oral tradition. So we've gone from the oral tradition, of course, to the written and the print edition, uh, tradition. And so written and print. So here, letters. I can go back as far as caveman drawings to tell a story. Um, letters, um, if not letters, then newspapers and books. And so as we start looking at what is the written tradition and the print tradition, we go back to even the mass production of print back when we talk about the Gutenberg Press, for instance. 
uh, if you remember your uh, European history, when the particular press was put together and we started having the ability to mass produce ideas written down on paper to disseminate ideas in a much greater than just person going from town to town and telling a story, uh, greater than um, the, the number of people who could just constantly write letters or copy the same letter or text in handwriting uh, on and on, the printing press made huge leaps forward for us in terms of being able to uh, communicate and communicate ideas much more uh, fully. And so from there, of course, we went to, and, and you following along on page 244, we went to the electronic tradition. This is what we refer to as the first media age, which includes um, electronic access to content. So this might be certainly broadcast, um, television, radio, uh, and then eventually we get to the second media age, which is the what we're calling the new media tradition, and this is, um, we're talking about the introduction of the internet. Exponentially, ideas grow and then now can be communicated throughout an individual's uh, that much more greater. Um, and as such, when we're connecting people and ideas, um, one of the ways we even connect when we're isolated, perhaps like now, um, we're able to actually discuss with people um, things on the internet and have conversations and have even broadcast uh, scenarios like we're doing at the present time. Because, of course, by the time you're looking at this, I've pre-recorded it and I've already moved on to another project while you're looking at the ideas that I'm relaying to you presently. So, what are the characteristics of new media? Well, as opposed to traditional oral tradition, as opposed to uh, written, uh, as opposed to broadcasting, one of the characteristics of new media theory, which becomes really important if you look on page 247, is the idea that we are very interactive. Almost everything we put out, we have the possibility of, of, of putting feedback, um, everything we put out, we have the possibility of adding commentary, even if it's as simple as thumbs up, thumbs down concept, just a simple click, and we're somehow being interactive and giving feedback. Remember the beginning of our semester when we talked about the communication model, and I've got communicator A, communicator B, channels, message, and feedback going back and forth. Well, through this new uh, interactive media scenario, uh, in this new interactive phase, uh, we're allowed or we're able to have a much more interaction than we ever could have before. And in fact, um, while people are um, across the country in stay-at-home orders with this uh, new quarantine reality that we're facing, one of the things that I think we're looking at more and more is the whole idea of how do we connect live, you can see me, I can see you, teleconferencing. Um, and how is it that now with Zoom and Facebook and iPhone, video calls, video chats, video conferences are now the norm, not the exception. I mean, I remember the days, for example, when uh, if you wanted to do a video conference call, you actually had to reserve time at a commercial video conferencing facility. Um, such as Kinko's, which became then uh, FedEx stores, and, and I don't think they even have those now because it's so easy to do this just online, on your own computer and on your own phones. Uh, Zoom being one of those that everybody is talking about, who uh, the organization that has truly stepped up to try and provide uh, video conferencing for everybody in this current day and age. Uh, the other thing about besides interacting, be, being interactive, is we can personalize conversation and inter you know communication much more online, but that also uh, allows us to be creative. What do I mean by um, personalizing? You might remember the last video uh, from the last chapter. I actually had a video a little bit farther away, straight on at this particular room. The video prior to that I did in my uh, kitchen slash dining room uh, on one of the counters. Um, am I being creative? Well, in part, I'm trying to give um, 
so, something so you can even, you know, oh, look, maybe tell the difference. Or maybe I'm also exploring options. Let's try and see which thing works better for us on this particular um, mode. Uh, you know, what works better for me and what kind of feedback am I getting from you? So creativity can certainly be uh, come into play. So can flexibility, because I can record this any time of the day or night, and at the same time, you're able then to review it any time once I put it up, any time during the day or night that is better suited for you specifically to sit down and watch this. So flexibility becomes really uh, uh, great as well. And also, how about always evolving? Things are changing very fast right now, and in fact, based on some of the new realities that we're facing, the fact is we're probably going to have um, some of this conferencing back and forth as part of our permanent um, uh, mode. Because people, I, I think, are going to find from corporation standpoints that it's just cheaper to let you work from home and start measuring work product, if I had to make a prophecy here, uh, start measuring work product and paying people by the product that they... They, their outputs and that they can measure rather than the hours that they're clocking, depending upon the job. There will always be jobs where um, people ha are, are going to be paid by the hour because they're going to specifically need to be somewhere um, and maybe meet people um, as well. So let's talk about identity online. Um, see, one of the interesting things when we talk about CMC or computer mediated communication, which is pretty much what this is, um, you have the capacity and the ability to sort of craft an identity. How do you want people to see you? Well, you know, let's face it. Um, could I be giving a presentation like this, having only this much of my body on a uh, camera, and then therefore not have to wear sh shoes or socks, for instance? Yeah, I could. Um, because it's I, one could still look professional because that's all you're seeing, for example, of me. Could I have chosen, for example, a shirt and tie and taken a much more formal route? I could have. I could have. And so one of the things that we were allowed to do is kind of craft or at least help shape consciously our identity. So another example, what is the name that we use for our email address? You see, there's a big difference between having an email address that is marked um, John Smith at then even a public website, for instance, um, you know, yahoo.com, gmail.com, something like that, versus having an, a website that you know is like uh, uh, Nintendo Champion 2004. Dot, you know, uh, John Smith at Nintendo. Uh, I'm sorry, Nintendo Champion 2004 at gmail.com. Well, you might be telling some, some people about your hobby and your achievements and that thing, but just like cutiepie123 at yahoo.com, it's not going to give you the same impression as your name. And you can see that identity crafting will leave impressions all the way through. And so this is also a nonverbal, in some cases, right? It's a verbal because it's, a written, it's the written word but nonverbal impression because of the content behind the image that comes to us as we're reading what, what that is. So think about that as we go. Um, identity formation is important because we're developing ourselves, And we do indeed have a couple things to note. Number one, we can craft a lot of what people see and how they see it online. But we also have to remember, especially with social media, anything we put up, never goes away. Let me say that again. Anything we put up on social media never goes away. The important part about that is when people Google us, like potential job interview can uh, bosses, things like this, job candidate committees, they're likely to. What did you ever put up online that you might not necessarily be proud of today? See, these are the, some of those things that we don't always realize may come back and haunt us. And, you know, when we talk about job interviews, now I've taught both job committees, hiring committees, you know, kind of the ropes, if you will, on, on training how to actually interview and go through the job search process. But then at the same time, I've also uh, done um, a number of uh, coaching for job candidates. 
And see, the interesting thing about that is one, one of the things that kind of gets lost in the shuffle there, perhaps the second question, with it, when a job committee gets together to try and start talking about the candidates that they have collected resumes from of people that are interested in the vacancy, what often happens is that we wind up with um, people for asking question number one, so did you all get a chance to look through those uh, resumes up to this point? And who do you like? And then question number two, all right, who's Googled these people? You see, it's not illegal. And if they found something, for example, by Googling you uh, in your social media, you will never know if they were offended by something. You will never know why you didn't get the call. I'm going to sneeze, so I'm going to pause this for just a moment. So you're never going to know why you didn't get the call. And that's, you know, you'll just think, okay, there must have been other candidates. They didn't call me. They weren't interested. Now, the other interesting thing about developing yourself online, you've heard the term catfishing, where it's also easier to misrepresent who you are, sometimes intentionally. And so we've got to be careful with that. Now, when we look at page uh, 256, Screen names, the same idea that I just talked about with email addresses, for example, same idea with screen names apply as well. So all of that sends a message. Be very careful about the kind of message you're choosing to send based on that. Okay. Um, blogs uh, and personal profiles and social media in general, this is all we've been talking about, right? Well, let me just kind of take this from the uh, idea of the job of, of someone looking for a job. Okay, someone looking for a job. It is my distinguished uh, um, advice that if you are ever to the point of searching for a job, turn your social media profiles to private or off. And if you don't personally know everybody in your social media profile connection list. So in Facebook, we call them friends. In LinkedIn, we call them links. Um, you know, if you're, in, if, if you're old enough to be in MySpace, for example, um, you know, MySpace, um, or whatever social media you might be working in, Snapchat, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things I would highly suggest is while you're looking for a job, turn those social media profiles to private or to off and boot everybody you don't already know personally and the reason I say that and I want you to think about this very carefully is a lot of times we have uh, as a society allowed people to connect with us on those social media sites some of them might even be Russian bots for that matter but on the other hand there might be just a, uh, might be people that we connected with because we were playing a game that meant the more people in our mob mafia or farm whatever it might be uh, somehow the the more we're able to collect accolades and little picture awards or whatever it might be, uh, badges and stuff, and leveling up and things of this nature. Um, so we wind up allowing a lot of people we don't know. And so we're, we have this, and have had uh, as, a, as a group, a very easy and quick um, response to just, especially if we're playing a game, of just accepting anybody who wanted to be our friend on any of these social media sites. What happens with that is um, then when we're out looking for a job, so somebody's going to Google you, it happens a lot. And if they, if, if they find that your social media profile is not accessible, oftentimes what they might just simply do is just click to be your friend. I would not suggest accepting that particular invite, but you don't always know who is connected to that particular organization, especially if you're pulling people, accepting people uh, ad hoc, uh, you know, just complete, if they actually ask, you're already adding them, no problem, especially because you're doing it for a gain, for instance. So if that's happening, um, it's, it's, it could be a problem because now you've given somebody permission to find an excuse to be insulted and thus never call you for an interview and you've kind of hurt your own chances there. So. Put your social media profiles to private or off. 
I'd start combing through and seeing if there are things, you know, until you have the, the career and the job you truly want. Um, you know, remember, of course, anything you put out there in the public represents not only you, but a lot of employers will also see it as being representative of e their company as because you are a representative of their company or their organization. And so we've got to be very careful because what we put out on social media can also have some very dangerous and serious effects in real life. So if you are putting something that you think, oh, it's not offensive, it's you holding an, uh, a, a cup or a wine glass, for instance. Well, if you're dealing with people who think are anti-alcohol, that's going to be an issue. If you're, de if you're putting up something that, putting up uh, texts and posts and things like this that are very um, uh, political, one side or another, and you're, you know, the people that you're trying to get a job with, are very political, just so happens it's the other side. In today's divisive society right now, that would be a death knell to you not getting an interview for that particular position. So we need to be careful with that. Social media needs to be paid attention to in terms of what we're really doing with it, how we're, we're, we're critically analyzing what we're putting up. Because a lot of times we just think we're doing something very innocent, when in fact we're not. Um, and so, go through um, this chapter as you are able. Um, see where it converges, new media and your life sort of converges um, and kind of comes together. And I'm going to go ahead and put up the quiz for this chapter, chapter 10, um, and a discussion question. And then we will move on next week to chapter 11. And what I might... Uh, do for is we start getting into chapter 11 and the like we might talk about um, putting together your we have to give one small speech so we may have to talk to get uh, put together one small speech for you to put together and give give up make it a three to five minute presentation um, and th at this case right now I'm gonna let you just do it on camera whether or not you have anybody in the room or not um, I don't normally do that because we talk about doing a, a presentation uh, about and I usually do the presentations about the film you were supposed to pick out that's also in the uh, syllabus. So check the syllabus and um, see if there's a film there that uh, listed there that that is of uh, interest to you, so that you can watch watch that film and take some notes based on what we're looking at here in the uh, in the uh, uh, chapters and um, put together a small presentation. I'll do another speech um, when we talk next week, another speech. I will do another uh, conversation with you uh, when I talk about next week's chapter specifically about that. Um, but uh, most of you should be able to record that with your cell phones and then just upload them to me. Okay, uh, I'm not going to rattle on too much longer. Where I'm at about 23, 24 minutes here um, with this chapter, but you kind of get, I think, the... the, 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 the uh, uh, the absolute prime information specifically that we want you to get out of this chapter and pay attention to. Uh, identity, we form it, we create it, we destroy it. Um, we can be deceptive with it, and all of this is the identity we hold online. We know the term catfishing, um, where we're trying to pretend we're somebody else. This is probably done on a lot more dating sites than anything else, but still, at some level, um, a lot of us even do this on Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and the like. Now, is that actually, actually catfishing when we're just trying to bolster ourselves and put our best foot forward? If there's truth in it, probably not. It may not. It may be we are a certain kind of people when we're at the office than somewhere else. That's a different sort of a story. Maybe you're just picking out different sides of you to put on that particular uh, social media. Okay, uh, that's what I've got for for this week. I will hopefully see you soon. Um, but uh, if you have any uh, issues or questions, uh, you know how to get a hold of me through Canvas. Thanks so much. Be well.